So uh, it's really, uh, I'm really happy to be here. Um, you know, I feel like I have a really deep connection um, with uh, the physics department here uh, at the University of Illinois. I, um, <clears throat> um, I haven't, I never, I didn't spend any time working here, um, but I was born here. Um, yeah, I spent the first two years of my life um, in in Urbana, so I feel like I have a special connection here. But then, you know, of course, more recently, I have many, many friends here, so I feel like it is a sort of a homecoming to come to come here. Um, so uh, I also I, I I never did any work with Tony Leggett, um, but I did spend a very um, uh, formative period of my uh, career working with Matthew Fisher on the theory of Luttinger liquids. And that was work that was, you know, um, very much inspired by the caldera legged model. So um, so again, I'm really uh, happy to uh, to be here, part of this uh, celebration. So, um, so I wanna uh, talk about something I've been thinking about for the last uh, few years, um, which is a um, application of topology to electronic systems that's a little bit different than, than what we've usually been uh, thinking about. And, um, uh, and it has to do with the fact that the Fermi, you know, surface of a metal is a is a topological object. You know, the Fermi surface of copper is basically like a fancy donut. So there's a topological number associated um, with that. And so uh, I've been exploring what consequences that fact uh, might. Okay. So what I'd like to describe is is some of the consequences I've I've noticed. And um, you know, this talk, you know. It, on some level, it's going to be a little bit trivial. It's going to be another um, example of my talent for um, uh, uh, sort of noticing curious facts about non-interacting electrons. Um, and uh, and um, so so most of what I'm going to have to say is really going to be about non-interacting electrons. And there's an interesting question of what happens with interactions, and I have less to say about that. Okay, so um, uh, but in any case, I'm going to show you that uh, the topology of the Fermi surface shows up in in nonlinear properties of um, the Fermi gas, in particular the nonlinear response um, and also nonlinear correlations. Okay, um, and um, uh, you know, so I'm going to spend some time uh, talking about this. Um, uh, it also shows up in the um, uh, in the uh, entanglement. Okay, and so this is where I will have something a little bit to say about uh, about interactions. Okay. And um, we've also worked out uh, some, some sort of experimental uh, proposals for how to get at this. I, I, I think I'm probably not going to have time since I only have 25 minutes um, to, uh, to talk about this last part. But, um, but this is another uh, uh, area that we've um, worked on. OK, so, um, uh, so how do we describe the topology of the Fermi C? And so I want to introduce you to a topological invariant um, called the Euler characteristic. Okay, and, and so the Euler characteristic is something that characterizes the shape of, of, um, of some. Um, and uh, so there's a mathematical definition that you can give for the Euler characteristic in terms of Betty numbers. Um, but, but it's, it's uh, some specific cases, you know, one, two, and three dimensions. Um, in one dimension, um, if you have a Fermi C, you just have, you know, uh, an inter interval in momentum space, the other characteristic is basically just counting the number of intervals, okay, or the number of simple integer that characterizes a one-dimensional Fermi system. In two dimensions, um, what it is, is um, it's the difference between the number of electron-like Fermi surfaces and the number of hole-like Fermi surfaces, okay? Um, uh, in three dimensions, it's related to the genus, just so like copper has, you know, the handles on it. So um, the uh, the Euler characteristic of the three-dimensional Fermi C is related to the genus of of, of the Fermi surface. So um, so this is what the Euler characteristic is, and there's uh, uh, sort of um, a finer point to this, which is one can talk about the Euler characteristic of the Fermi surface. C, which is what is inside the Fermi surface, okay, and and it's actually they're a little they're related to each other, but they're a little bit different. Actually, in two dimensions, every Fermi surface is a circle, and every circle is um, has Euler characteristic zero is trivial, okay. Um, but the interior um, uh, uh, it distinguishes between electron-like and hole-like uh, Fermi surfaces, and so um, uh, so in fact um, uh, uh, in um, in uh, even dimensions, like two dimensions, 
the uh, the Fermi surface always has a uh, you know zero. Um, uh, but in odd dimensions, it's related to the um, the Euler characteristic in the battery. So the point is the point I want to make is that the Euler characteristic C has a little bit more information in it than the Euler. Okay. All right. And you know, um, so it's a you know it's a topological number. It doesn't change if you make smooth deformations unless you go through a topological transition, which is if your Fermi energy passes through like a saddle point, then. Um, then you can, you know, you can then then this changes, and so of course this transition where the Fermi energy passes through a saddle point is called a Lipschitz uh, transition. So that's a topological transition for this uh, topological invariant. Okay, so so one can ask the question: How does this um, uh, show up? Um, and um, what uh, you know, basically my strategy for for this is 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 to first think about one dimension about one dimension and then ask whether they can be generalized to higher dimensions, okay? And so one thing I know about one dimension is that actually this invariant does show up in a very simple way in something that I know about, and that's the Landauer conductance. Um, so if you have a one-dimensional conductor, non-interacting electrons, um, then uh, you know the uh, conductance just measures the number, you know, if it's ballistic, it just measures the number of one-dimensional subbands, and that's precisely this topological invariant, okay? And so, um, so the question is: Is this something that can um, can generalize? And um, you know, and and this quantization is um, you know it's kind of related to the integer quantum Hall effect. Um, it's not as good as the integer quantum Hall effect because, of course, if you have impurities, then you screw it up. Okay, um, but uh, but maybe we can try to think about it the way we think about the uh, integer quantum Hall effect. Um, and um, the way you understand the quantization in the integer quantum Hall effect is through uh, Laughlin's argument. So you can imagine um, if you have your one-dimensional system and you put it on a uh, on a ring, then um, if you uh, count the number of electrons that are moving to the you know moving in one direction to the right around uh, 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 going around the ring, um, if you thread a quantum of magnetic flux through the um, through the ring, then that number of electrons moving to the right um, uh, changes by one. Okay, and so that's you know that's you know that's of course that's Laughlin's argument for the quantization of the integer quantum Hall effect. Here, what we're talking about, we're talking about the change in the number of right moving uh, electrons. Okay, and of course, you know the fact that the number of right moving electrons changes is telling you something something deep. Um, it's telling you about the chiral anomaly for the right moving electrons. Okay, um, and um, and and this it changes because. Um, as you thread the flux, there's exactly one electron that sort of changes its mind about whether um, uh, moving to the right or moving to the left, okay? Because the right moving and left moving electrons are connected to each other uh, at, this, um, at this critical point. So, um, uh, so, so, uh, uh, um, so this is one uh, you know, way we can it, you think about this. And of course, if you have more uh, you know, uh, components of your Fermi C, then the number of the, the, the change in the number of right movers will just count the, uh, sure. count the number of Fermi surfaces you have. Okay. So, um, so, so how can we step this up a dimension? So a simple thing that one can uh, contemplate is a sort of a two-dimensional version of this argument. So now, uh, rather than a circle, I can put my two-dimensional electrons on a torus. And now I have two fluxes thread, okay? And so, um, uh, and basically what I want to do is I want to count the number of electrons that are moving, you know, uh, uh, up and to the right and ask how that changes. So if I thread a flux through one of the holes, then, then basically what's going to happen is every, every electron is going to move over by one space. And so there are going to be a whole bunch of extra electrons moving to the right. But the, um, and, and you know, and so there'll be a bunch of elect extra electrons moving up into the right. But most of those electrons don't care whether I thread the other flux. Okay. And so what I want to ask is I want to ask what's the change in the number of electrons moving up into the right due to both fluxes. And what you can see is that it's only going to be there's going to be one electron that sort of crosses here that's affected by the second that that, that you know that was affected by both fluxes. Okay. And so. Um, so this change in the number of electrons um, uh, is going to be exactly um, a one in this case. And, um, and so I want to argue that this actually is sensitive to the topology of the Fermi. So I could look at this for a more complicated uh, Fermi. Some holes in it. As a non, you know, 
a less trivial uh, Euler characteristic. And what you can see is that you're going to get a contribution every, you know, um, every point where you're sort of on the right side of the Fermi surface, where where it's about to, um, where there's a, you know, uh, where the where the velocity is moving to the right. Curvature is on. If you count the difference between the number and concave uh, vex points on the Fermi surface, uh, you can convince yourself that um, it's going to be exactly the Euler characteristic. Okay, and so so uh, so this uh, this sort of uh, second order version of Laughlin's argument is sensitive to the um, Euler characteristic of the of the two dimensional Fermi C. So so this uh, argument suggests that maybe there should be some version of the Landauer formula that um, you know for you know for measuring you know the the the, the charge response. Um, that uh, that that picks this up, and so let me give you a, a um, you know an attempt at uh, uh, doing that, which is to um, suppose now you know so of course you know I don't want to have a ring. What I want to do is I want to have a um, uh, you know uh, a extended um, a system, and then when I you know the the um, you know adding a doing the threading the flux is going to be like having a voltage pulse, okay? And then so in one dimension, if I have a voltage pulse, then there's going to be some electrons. That go off to the right, and that's going to be the extra right moving electrons that I have. Okay, and so so I want to do the same thing here. What I want to imagine is I have a two dimensional system, and I can apply a pulse um, in the x direction here, or I can apply a pulse in the y direction here. And what I want to do, you know, if I apply a pulse in the x direction, I want to count the number of electrons that show up in this in this quadrant, um, uh, and I want to count the number of electrons that that show up sort of due to both pulses. So I want to do both pulses, and I want to subtract off the individual pulses um, uh, by themselves. And so what, uh, what this you know, version of the Laughlin argument that I uh, gave you predicts is that basically there should be a response which is going to be the integrated area under both pulses um, uh, you know, times a quantized uh, 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 response function. OK? And um, so uh, um, uh, you know, so in principle, you know, so 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 you know, one could imagine setting up these pulses and doing this. Um, uh, you know, you have to do this subtraction. Um, maybe um, it would be uh, a little bit simpler. You could avoid doing the subtraction if you do it in the frequency domain. Okay, so I can imagine now instead um, oscillating my uh, 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 fields in the x and y direction at frequency omega one and omega two and then picking up the response at omega one plus omega two, okay? And that would be, give the contribution which is uh, due to both. And this gives some sort of um, nonlinear frequency dependent uh, response, okay? So, uh, so, okay, so we have this, you know, uh, response function. This is, uh, there's a calculation that gives this. It's an ex exact calculation, um, but it's an exact calculation in a rather specific setting. Um, which is a uh, infinite two-dimensional electron gas um, with no scattering and no interactions. Okay, so that's a little bit of a tall order. Um, uh, now, of course, um, uh, you know, if if I did it in a finite system, then that's going to set a lower bound for how low the frequency can be. Okay, so so unlike Landauer transport, I can't I can't take the DC limit. Okay. Because you know, if you think in terms of the pulses, I do the first pulse. If I then do the first pulse and go out and get a cup of coffee, and you know, at much later, uh, do the second pulse, the first pulse will have completely disappeared in a, in a finite system. Okay, so um, uh, so one has to do it fast enough that um, uh, you know, so there's a there's a the, the, the finite size sets a, a, a lower bound on the on the frequency. Now, and you know, another important uh, uh, fact is that. Um, uh, interactions, um, and in particular, like the Fermi liquid parameters, um, will actually change this result. Okay, and so um, so this is true for non-interacting electrons, and so this is another difference um, uh, uh, with the Landauer formula. Of course, you know the Landauer formula is not sensitive to interactions, but if you attempt to compute the Landauer formula um, in a Luttinger liquid using linear response theory, okay, which is actually the calculation that Matthew and I did, you know, long, long ago, um, then you find that it does depend on interactions, 
Okay, and um, so you calculate the finite frequency uh, conductance uh, in a Luttinger liquid. It depends on the Luttinger parameter. And, and basically, um, we're sort of stuck with this finite frequency response. And, um, and so, so it depends on the Fermi liquid parameters for the same reason that the Kubo conductance in a Luttinger liquid depends on the Luttinger parameter. Okay. All right. So, so you know, um, so I don't know whether this is going to be feasible to measure or not. Okay. Um, uh, it may, you know, there have been some proposals that one could do this um, uh, in uh, cold atom uh, systems, and that may be the best way um, uh, uh, to do this. Okay. Yes. Yes. Well, local, I mean, I'm applying an electric field locally, right? But, 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 you know, I mean, right. I mean, of course, land hour, you have to deal with, you, you deal with the leads, right? And, and, right. Yeah. And, uh, and, and so that's a slightly different uh, situation, but, um, but right. Yeah. So, so what this is analogous to is, is, um, you know, uh, uh, doing, you know, having a local AC field, Okay, and then the charge sloshes back and forth, and and then it's it's correct that the the the, the conductance depends on the on the Luttinger parameter in that case. So there's an order of limits problem taking omega to zero and the size to infinity. Okay, yeah. All right, good. Okay, so I want to talk about a a different um, uh, way that the topology shows up, which is um, to uh, uh, rather than thinking about response, I want to think about correlation, and so this is. Um, uh, Another uh, example where I want to start in one dimension and realize that I know something in one dimension and then ask whether it generalizes, okay? And so um, one thing that uh, is simple to think about in one dimension is the, um, uh, the correlations in the density, okay? So S of Q, okay, which is the density-density correlation function at equal time, okay? And so this is a simple thing to compute for a one-dimensional Fermi gas, okay? So this is a textbook uh, calculation. You know how you do it, you know, rho of Q, rho of minus Q, you, you know, C dagger C is what rho is, and then you use Wick's theorem to, you know, write it. And so what it ends up being is uh, um, a sum on the momentum of the Fermi occupation at K, and then one minus the Fermi occupation at K plus Q. So basically what it's doing is it's counting the number of electrons that are inside the Fermi surface, but K plus Q is outside. So, so that means it's just going to be a little interval of length Q next to one of the Fermi points. And of course, if there are several Fermi points, you get a contribution from each one. So, so, uh, so it's going to be exactly equal to the length of this interval, Q divided by 2 pi times this, um, times this integer, which counts the number of uh, Fermi surfaces. Okay, so, so this is an exact fact about non-interacting electrons in one dimension. OK, um, and so uh, so one can ask the question, does it generalize? OK, and it does generalize in a kind of interesting way. In fact, um, in two dimensions, there's a corresponding three, uh, uh, you know, uh, third order equal time correlation function that is quantized. And in three dimensions, there's a corresponding fourth order uh, equal time correlation function that is quantized. OK, and so um, so let me explain to you, uh, convince you that this is true. OK. So uh, actually, one of the things we've done most recently is we've realized that um, that this formula is obvious. Okay, um, and uh, let me let me uh, tell you why that formula is obvious. Okay, and what it, amounts, it basically amounts to is that it amounts to uh, it's an application of this famous old formula um, uh, by Euler, which where it showed that if you have a polyhedron that has a bunch of faces, edges, and vertices that if you add up the number of vertices minus the number of edges plus the number of faces, it's always equal to two, okay? And that number, that count, is, um, uh, is what we now call the Euler characteristic. That's why we call it the Euler characteristic, okay? Um, so this is a topological property of, of, of you know, of, of, a, uh, of a polyhedron. And basically what 
this result that we have amounts to is forming a triangulation of the Fermi C. So I, I, I replace the Fermi C by a bunch of uh, triangles, and I do this count of the number of points minus the number of links plus the number of triangles. So let me let me show you why this is true. So the reason is is so if I so if I calculate the uh, equal time correlation function, you know, you could do the same calculation that you did in one dimension. You use Wick's theorem, and then you know it's going to be Fermi occupation numbers, and and so basically. <clears throat> There are going to be two contractions. There are going to be two terms. And then each contraction is going to have a product of Fermi occupations or one minus Fermi occupations. And they're going to be at k and then, uh, and then k's that are related by q1 and q2. Um, and so, so everything depends on either k, k plus q1, k plus q2, or k plus q1 plus k q2. So, so it, it depends on the, the, for a given k in the integral, it's going to depend on the, the points that are sort of at the corners of a, of a parallelogram. And so what that, and these parallelograms tile the tile momentum space. So what it makes sense to do is to divide the integral over K into a integral over just one parallelogram times a sum over the lattice that's generated by Q1 and Q2. Okay. And, um, and so, uh, so let's just, let's uh, consider a particular uh, point in the integral and consider the sum over the lattice. If I multiply this out, you can see that there's going to be terms where there's a single f, there's a term where there are two f's, and there's going to be a term where there are three f's. And those terms are going to precisely count the number of points minus the number of links plus the number of triangles. Okay. And the beauty of that is now, of course, as I do my integral over k naught, this whole thing is going to slide, and there are going to be points which come and go. But since this count is Euler's count, it doesn't matter which what triangulation, as long as the topology stays the same, it, that stays the same. Okay, and so uh, so you can so basically this is independent of k naught. We can factor it out of the integral, and the integral over k naught is just the volume of the parallelogram. So that's why that formula is obvious. Okay. Oh, oh God. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, uh, interactions. Uh, so this is for non-interacting electrons. Um, uh, with interactions in a Fermi liquid, it'll be modified. Okay. Um, could it be measured? So 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 uh, so so uh, you know if we could measure it. Um, one way to do it is with uh, with cold atoms. Okay, so in fact, with cold atoms, it's possible to uh, make a Fermi gas and take a picture of it. Okay, and in principle, that has all the information. So our proposal is to measure this in real space with a cold, with a uh, atomic gas in real space. Measure this third order uh, correlation do it using real space imaging. And we, you know, even in a finite system, you know, hundred fermions, we sort of think that there should be enough signal to be able to get that. Okay. Another idea that we have um, for measuring it is to do a kind of nonlinear scattering experiment, measuring. Um, so you know, you know, because X-ray scattering measures S of Q. Okay. But um, so what we want to do is we want to uh, basically measure the correlations in the um, scattered wave. So uh, if you send in an X-ray pulse, then there's going to be a kind of a speckle pattern that gets created due to the uh, due to the interference and um, and what we have shown is that the core, there are going to be correlations in this speckle pattern that, again, know about this third order uh, correlation function. Okay, and so uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, this is a situation where, uh, in order to make this happen, um, I need to get to know people who know about X-rays, and so uh, that's one of the things I've been trying to do. Okay, so um, yeah, well, I know. <laughs> so uh, so okay, so this is a. Um, uh, you know, uh, a, a, a possible direction that maybe it's an interesting thing uh, using uh, X-ray scattering to measure these higher order uh, correlations. Okay. All right. So uh, I'm, I'm I'm out of time. I wanted to tell you a little bit about entanglement. Let me just tell give you the punchline for uh, the entanglement story because everything I said was about non-interacting electrons. And so you can ask the question: Is there anything you know that's that's true that remains true when you have interactions? Okay. And one thing that um, that is true is um, if you consider the structure of the quantum entanglement, um, 
uh, 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 there is a, uh, you know, in three dimensions, there's a, there's a four party uh, uh, mutual information, um, which, um, which uh, uh, does have a universal log divergence. And, and this is closely related to what happens in one dimension. There's a universal uh, uh, logarithmically divergent bipartite entanglement entropy in any um, one dimensional conformal field theory. Okay. And so this is a kind of a, a generalization of that. Which um, I would, you know, love to be able to tell you more about, but I want to uh, stick with uh, Philip's uh, uh, words here. So, uh, so why don't we just finish up? And I'm happy to take questions. Okay. That would be, I'd be very interested to talk. So the answer is I, I have very much wanted to find, um, uh, you know, uh, properties that where the land parameters drop out. Um, and uh, I would like to learn about that from you. So yeah, let's talk. If you want to talk about higher moments of the charge density. Yeah, I don't know. That's a that's an interesting question. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's like looking at the. Um, I mean, that's going to be related to the Q dependence right. of the charge correlation exactly. function, yeah. right? So, um, right, right, yeah. So, so you know, so what we've found is that in this Fermi gas, that um, that the the that for small Q, it has a universal. The equal time correlations have this universal Q dependence. Okay, so so maybe that has some of that in there. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is a zero temperature, right? And so there's going to be, you know, so there's going to be a temperature scale, which is the Fermi energy, right? Well, it's no, it goes to constant at zero temperature. Well, then maybe there'd be some T squared. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't think it's going to be. It's not going to be. Um, there aren't going to be any anomalous exponents. I don't think. Um, Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Though, of course, so in two dimensions, it's not topological, right? Because you get an area law. Okay. Um, uh, and so that's the reason why we wanted to do the multi-party entanglement because we want to basically have re the problem is you have an area law your your regions meet on an area right you want something that's associated with a point so in two dimensions three regions meet at a point and 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 in three dimensions four regions meet at a point yeah and and that's exactly my point is that what we have shown so so one so one thing is that the the entanglement is related to the number correlations for a Fermi gas. Okay, the number correlations do depend on the interact on the Landau parameters, but the entanglement does not. 